has joined, good afternoon. Welcome to another installment of our ongoing virtual series, Alumni Conversations. Today we are speaking, from, or we are hearing from School of Health Professions alumnus, Dr. Steve Carlin. Dr. Carlin currently serves as the Major League Physical Therapist for the Miami Marlins Baseball Organization. It's his third year with the club. He spent the previous two seasons as the Minor League Rehab Coordinator. Dr. Carlin completed the Upper Extremity Athlete Fellowship Program with the Kansas City Royals and an ATI Physical Therapy and an Orthopedic Residency Program with Memorial Hermann Ironman Sports Medicine Institute in Houston, Texas. He completed his undergraduate work at Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and graduated physical therapy school here at the Health Science Center. Dr. Carlin is a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist and resides in Western Florida with his wife, Dr. Tiffany Carlin, who is also a graduate of the Health Science Center. So thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Carlin. Well, thank you, Hannah, for that introduction and for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, we are going to jump right into it. So you were a pitcher for the baseball team at Bucknell University where you did your undergrad. You even went, underwent Tommy John surgery for an elbow injury. Did your experience as a student athlete contribute to your desire to become a physical therapist? Yeah, it did. Um, going through the rehab process on the patient end was really my first exposure to PT. Um, previous to this, I really had no idea what physical therapy looked like. Um, I was actually an economics major at Bucknell and had some investment banking interviews after school when I realized that wasn't really the route that I wanted to go. So my uh, parents kind of encouraged me to look back on my PT experiences, um, which I went through in college. And um, as, a, as a young athlete, even one that is below average or was below average in my case, um, you often see yourself as invincible. So it was pretty intimidating to go through a 12 to 14 month recovery that Tommy John surgery is. Um, and obviously having a good surgery um, is critical, but you know, I really got to experience firsthand uh, the powerful impact that PT can have on a successful outcome. And from a, from a patient perspective, something that really stood out to me during the process was just getting to observe my PT work and the other clinicians around him um, and just the, the different strategies that they implemented to get people moving better and feeling better and um, their vast knowledge base about uh, different pathologies and I really got hooked on the positive energy in the clinic um, and you know the the goals and the tools that my therapist equipped me with with my programming even carried on after I was done with PT um, and I think that really helped shape the way that I practice today. Absolutely and the economic banking world's loss is the health science center's gain. We are happy <laughs> switched courses and, and came to the Health Science Center. So on that note, why did you choose the UNT Health Science Center as the place to pursue your degree in physical therapy? Uh, to be completely honest, it was actually the only program that I got accepted to. So it was <laughs> UNT that chose me um, and it could not have worked out more in my favor. Um, but actually one of my cousins, Lauren Herman, um, graduated from TCOM um, and she mentioned to me that the school at the time was developing a new PT program um, and spoke very highly of the school in general. So I, I applied to UNT and got an interview. Um, it was one of, the, one of the few programs that actually had in-person interviews at the time, uh, which gave me a chance to meet faculty, interact with current students, and see, just see the facilities and what the, get, a, get a glimpse of what the experience would be like. Um, and it was pretty clear that the school had, had invested a lot to ensure the program would be a strong one. And um, I ended up making off like a bandit with a degree. I was in a <laughs> good position post-graduation uh, with different post-professional opportunities. And uh, like you mentioned, I, I met my, my wife there who works for a hospital system down in Miami. So I, I got a pretty good uh, return on my investment. For sure, it all worked out. Uh how would you say that your time at the Health Science Center and the education you got prepared you for your career in physical therapy? Um, a, a few things that really jump out during my experience. I would say, just broadly speaking, I think the school does a really nice job of tying together the different disciplines and emphasizing the importance of collaborative care. Um, at the time, as a student, you know, I was pretty focused on exams and you're thinking about the practical test you have the next day 
Um, and you know, at the time I thought that the interprofessional meetings were just kind of getting in the way of that daily grind. And looking back now, I can really see how valuable and critical it is to be able to function as a part of uh, a healthcare team, particularly in my current role. We're evaluated on how effectively our sports medicine staff and performance staff work as a cohesive unit. And on a daily basis, I'm working with athletic trainers, orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine physicians, strength coaches, field staff, um, and, and the quality of our care that we provide our players is dependent upon our ability to work together uh, collectively. Um, when looking at just the, the physical therapy program at UNT, I felt more than equipped to pass the board's exam, which is obviously very important. Uh, but more than that, I was, I was fortunate to have some unique opportunities after graduation um, that I wouldn't have been possible without some of the experiences I had in PT school. Um, one of them uh, was during my uh, final specialized clinical rotation, happened to be at a clinic that worked a lot with baseball players and young athletes. And this was actually a new clinical affiliation at the time that the director of clinical education, Dr. Schwartz, helped establish with me. And um, that really helped spark my interest working with baseball players. Um, I also had really, really awesome mentorship and guidance from a couple faculty members that I'd like to highlight. Um, Dr. Nichols and Dr. Connors at the time really helped put together a roadmap for me for pursuing residency training after school and I owe a lot to them for that. That is great to hear. You completed the orthopedic residency program um, at Memorial Hermann Ironman Sports Medicine Institute in Houston. What was your residency experience like? So for those that aren't familiar, um, a, a residency is, is post-professional training, typically a year long. In my case, it was 13 months. Um, and the, the program is aimed at developing advanced physical therapists within a defined area of practice. So there are many different specialized areas, uh, acute, cardiopulm, neurology, sports, pediatrics. But for me, I chose to pursue an orthopedic uh, residency program. Um, and it was, a, it was a very challenging but enriching um, process. And, during, during the residency, the opportunities were endless. Um, I was involved in clinical research, uh, teaching at a local PT program in Houston, um, making rounds with physicians, having surgical observations, you're in weekly didactic coursework uh, to prepare you for the specialist examination that's taught by content experts. Um, and when you're in clinic, you have dedicated mentorship hours every week where uh, experts are observing you and giving you immediate uh, direct feedback. And this really helped improve my clinical decision making and practice patterns a lot. So if you could kind of put yourself back in the mindset of a student and go back to your time as a student at the Health Science Center and in your residency, what advice would you offer to our current PT students? I think finding a good mentor is key and really important. And this applies to both students and new grads. Um, particularly in school, a lot of information is thrown at you and having a quality mentor can really help weed out the noise and help you target what is really important. And uh, after graduation, a, a, a mentor can help guide you along the way in your professional development. Um, and I've been very fortunate to have some great ones along the way. Absolutely. So you currently work in Major League Baseball for the Marlins. Um, you've also done an upper extremity athlete fellowship with the Kansas City Royals. Were you drawn um, to working in Major League Baseball because of your experience as an athlete yourself or was getting involved in the MLB specifically a career goal of yours? Yeah, so to be honest, I really didn't know that teams had full-time PTs on staff until I applied for the fellowship. Um, and it's physical therapy and baseball is actually still a relatively new concept. Um, as of last year, every team but one has a full-time uh, physical therapist on staff. And it was pretty interesting at the big winter meetings this past off season where members of teams get together. Um, it was one of the first 
collective uh, group meetings of uh, physical therapist society and baseball. Um, so it's still a, a pretty new concept. Um, but when, when I was in residency, one of, the, one of my faculty members knew I had an interest in working with overhead athletes and recommended that I check out the, the fellowship program, mm -hmm. uh, which is, was a six month experience in Greenville, South Carolina with ATI physical therapy training under uh, Chuck Thigpen and Ellen Shanley. Um, and it in collaboration with the Stedman Hawkins Clinic. And you, you get to treat a lot of youth throwers, high school throwers, and get involved in some of their research process. Um, and then the, the second half of the fellowship is, was with the Kansas City Royals at their spring training facility in Surprise, Arizona. Um, so that was my first exposure to working in baseball and working in a training room setting as their fellow. And I, I definitely got hooked on the experience. And uh, fortunately, a position opened up at the end of the fellowship with the Marlins, um, and I jumped at the opportunity. So on that note, you've been with the Marlins for, this is your third season with the organization. Your first two seasons, you were the minor league rehab coordinator. Can you tell us more about that role and, and your experience in that role? Sure. So last two years, I was based full-time out of the player development complex for the Marlins, which is in Jupiter, Florida. Um, this serves as a central hub for our minor league system. Uh, it's where we have spring training every year and in a normal season as baseball activities going on virtually all year. Mm -hmm. And we rehab all of our long-term injured uh, players out of the Jupiter complex within our minor league uh, system. So my primary role was overseeing those long-term injured players care um, throughout the entire farm system, which includes any any player from our Dominican Republic Academy all the way up uh, into to AAA so our entire uh, affiliate system and it was my focus to coordinate taking a player from day of injury or day of surgery and getting them all the way back to games so within this process I worked alongside athletic trainers strength coaches mental skills professionals, um, our, our physicians, and we actually have a, a dedicated rehab pitching, pitching coach and a rehab position player coach that uh, work daily with the players um, and assist in getting them back to sport. So um, the way it was structured and currently is structured is that this group of rehab players is actually separate from our, our healthy population initially. So you're, you're spending six, sometimes seven days a week uh, with these players. So a lot goes into planning their programming and their rehab progressions. And um, these players have dedicated time in the training room, in the weight room, and on, on field activities uh, under the supervision of the rehab staff that I mentioned um, until they're back in games. And at that time, the, the care of those players shifts back to their respective teams and under the primary medical supervision of athletic trainers. Um, I also assisted with different serial testing and data collection that our sports medicine team collects to monitor uh, players' workload or injury risk um, and, and uh, just kind of serve as a support role for athletic, athletic training staff. So your current role is now the major league team physical therapist for the Marlins. Can you kind of give us an overview of how that differed from your previous two seasons and kind of let us know what your job functions are and what a typical day or season would look like pre-COVID um, in, in your current position? Sure. Um, so my role has shifted to focus more at the major league level, uh, but in general, my responsibilities still remain the same um, in, in, terms in, in terms of focusing on uh, our long-term injured players. Um, the volume is a little less, uh, so I'm able to work a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, which is nice. Um, I also help oversee injury protocols and develop programs for mitigating injury risk throughout the system um, and continue to serve as a support role uh, for our athletic training staff uh, in, in this setting uh, on home game days because I am, I am stationed out of our uh, main stadium in Miami and um, don't travel for road trips, so we, we'll, we'll keep players behind. Um, but on home game days, I'll assist uh, and 
kind of a support role. Um, but as far as a typical schedule, it's really variable and depends on the time of year. Um, but starting with spring training, uh, you're essentially working six day, six weeks, seven days a week, um, 12 to 15 hour days. So those can be pretty long, uh, demanding days. And, uh, once, once the season gets started, like I said, I'm stationed out in Miami. So, um, game days typically start around noon, um, with rehab players coming in early to complete their programs or any on field work. And then, uh, once they complete their work, I transition to help out the training staff to get prepared for the game and assist them with, um, you know, helping out any players pregame. Um, and then during or after the game is over, we're evaluating any new injuries and developing action plans uh, for them. And um, ideally, the, the season goes from late March to October if we're making a playoff push. Yes, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Um, so obviously, the field of athletics in general has been heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. What would you say from your perspective um, are some struggle, struggles or obstacles that you face as a physical therapist in Major League Baseball during these times? Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting and challenging year for everybody. Um, during the shutdown, I shifted more to a coordinator mode and uh, helped set up players with uh, satellite PT locations um, because our uh, organization sent everyone home um, for their safety. So. Um, a couple players that weren't able to attend physical therapy that needed it, I ended up doing telehealth visits with them, which was a first for me. Um, and there was, <laughs> there was certainly a learning curve there. Um, but once, once the players came back and were coming out of the shutdown, uh, one of our obvious concerns as a staff generally were that our players would be undertrained or ramp up too quickly for spring training 2.0. So um, we players and staff had to get pretty creative with identifying strategies for players to continue to maintain physical capacity at home and um, continue to get exposure to baseball activities during the shutdown. Um, and then once, once the season resumed, um, you know, the, the schedule has been shortened, which has placed different demands on players um, with double headers and uh, less, less off days. So, you know, we've, as a staff had to really stay on top of ensuring that players are recovering uh, sufficiently. Mm -hmm. How would you say that COVID-19 has maybe changed your, your day to day or just, you know, the, the things that used to just be second nature that you would do every day that maybe have had to be altered during all of this. So the, obviously uh, it's impacted everybody and um, our schedule has changed quite a bit um, to ensure the safety of everyone. Um, frequent testing, and um, temperature checks has become the norm and part of the routine. Uh, we have limited time working with players on a daily basis, and there's also limited personnel allowed in the building. So we have to be pretty strategic with scheduling and our daily plan to, to be the most efficient with, uh, with our time while still prioritizing safety. Um, so it's, it's certainly changed things a lot, but we're very fortunate to have access to some of the resources that we do. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so shifting kind of away from, from COVID-19, what, what advice would you give to anyone that is interested in getting involved in a career in sports medicine or working in the field of athletics? I think first, um, one must recognize, acknowledge that, um, it can be a very rewarding job but it also can come with pretty, pretty significant sacrifices um, in terms of working non-traditional hours, working holidays potentially, and it can, it can make for some pretty long uh, days during the season. Um, my wife and I have made our fair share of cross-country adventures over the last few years, moving uh, from Arizona to Florida to South Carolina, so uh, it, can, it can have challenges from that aspect. Um, if you do know for sure it's what you want to do, I, I always encourage younger PTs to look into post-professional training uh, after school. So residency fellowship training, it's a great avenue to um, build your resume, improve your uh, clinical skills, and potentially get your foot in the door if, um, if it's, the, if it's the a route involved with sports. Um, some teams, even for students, offer 
clinical rotations or volunteer opportunities uh, during a normal season. So I, I would encourage um, students to, you know, uh, look, look for opportunities such as that um, in, in the future. And um, networking can also be a very powerful tool. Don't be afraid to respectfully and professionally reach out to medical staff members of teams if you know that's what you're interested in doing and um, pick their brain and learn, learn about their jobs because there's a ton of variability in different sports and even different organizations within the same sport. Great advice. And you, you talked about how demanding the field of athletics can be in terms of your hours and you have to make sacrifices. So I know work-life balance is something that I think all professionals and, and students struggle with. What are some things that you do to help kind of maintain that work-life balance or, or take a break and make sure that, you know, you're protecting your, your mental health and, and still, you know, giving it all to your job? Sure. Um, I'm very fortunate because I'm based out of my home city and I, um, I, I don't travel with the team, so I, I have the luxury of being home every night. Um, so that is extremely helpful. But um, I think just taking care of yourself, you know, making sure you're exercising, eating right, still having time for yourself throughout the day, and um, strategic planning and preparation for the next day can always help. Uh, make sure you're getting you know that sufficient time for yourself and resting and recovering. Um, but I think. Going through uh, PT school and residency and fellowship training definitely helps prepare you for sleep deprivation and uh, being able to handle <laughs> some of the challenges that can come with with the job. So, right. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, I think that's probably advice that everyone can can heed. So, thank you for that. Um, so, we had some students and staff submit questions. So, I'm going to go ahead and move on to those. And if anyone um, in the audience today wants to ask Dr. Carlin a question, please just put it in the chat and we will um, get to it um, toward the end. Um, so this came from one of our um, big baseball fans um, here on staff. Um, he asked, MLB pitchers in the 1950s to 1980s didn't seem to worry about pitch counts and often pitched complete games. He even referenced Hall of Famer Bob Gibson, 34 starts in 1967 and 28 complete games. Um, today, there is strict monitoring of workload, and yet it seems pitchers experience more arm injuries than ever. Tommy John surgery is almost common. Did we not just hear about these injuries of yesterday, or, or what has changed since then? It's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's several factors here. Um, I think in today's game, generally speaking, peak fastball velocity and average fastball velocity is higher and has gradually increased over the last couple of decades, which we know with uh, more velocity comes more stress on the medial elbow. Um, I think one of the biggest contributing factors now is early sport specialization with our youth baseball players and kids playing year round baseball and just not getting a break. Um, that cumulative effect starting at those young ages really adds up um, over time, and I think is one of the one of the reasons why we do see we're seeing higher uh, Tommy John rates, particularly in our younger professional pitchers. Um, throwing to the radar gun, throwing harder at a younger age, um, attending scouting events in high school, um, using weighted balls incorrectly. These are all um, you know different factors that I think play into this complex problem, but. Um, I know Dr. Andrews is a really big advocate for uh, having dedicated time off from throwing for young kids. Um, so at least three months of consecutive time off from throwing um, for, for young kids. And um, I know they've, they've made a big push for addressing this uh, throwing injury ep epidemic. Sure, thank you for answering that. We are gonna move on to our student submitted questions now. Um, first one is, do you work with all athletes on a preventative basis or just those who get injured? So a little bit of both. Um, I would say my primary focus is uh, with those that are injured and um, with our healthy population, I'm more in kind of a support role with help, helping development, develop um, programs and protocols for mitigating injury risk in our healthy population. So um, I'm involved with different testing our entrance and exit physicals and different time points throughout the year and 
um, helping modify our players programming to, to suit any potential deficits that they might have that might be um, increasing their uh, risk for injury. So uh, yeah, I would, I would say I'm, I'm involved with both. Perfect. Um, what are some of the most common injuries that you see? Uh, this is interesting. Um, so when, when you look at the epidemiology of baseball injuries, the most common injury is actually hamstring strains. Um, obviously, you do, we do see a lot of shoulder and elbow injuries, uh, but lumbar-related pain and oblique strains are, are two of the most common uh, injuries you see in baseball. So this was kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to go um, an orthopedic certified specialist route uh, and, and chose an orthopedic residency because I wanted to have a well round Founded skill set for um, treating you know, a variety of injuries and uh, as you can see from uh, as you see from the numbers uh, there's there's variability with you know, treating low back cervical hip knee and baseball so I wanted to have a diverse clinical skill set to be ready to tackle this um, but uh, when you when you look at uh, time loss injuries so the the injuries with the the most significant amount of uh, contributing that results in uh, time missed from games, UCL injuries to the elbow um, are the most significant, and which is obvious due to the nature of throwing. Um, are there any other health professionals employed by the team, like a nutritionist, MD, et cetera, that, that you work with kind of consistently? Oh yeah, definitely. So um, full-time staff, we have um, athletic trainers, we, we have two physical therapists on staff, um, a sports psychologists, both in uh, Miami and our Jupiter com complex. Uh, we have registered dietitians. Uh, we, we contract with uh, the University of Miami um, who helps oversee our medical care in Miami and throughout our entire system. So mm -hmm. several of their physicians help provide coverage for us and uh, our oversee um, the, the medical care of our athletes. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, we have a diverse um, interprofessional relationship with, with uh, all the different professions. Sure. Kind of on that, on that route. And um, in what ways does your role on the team relate to or work with athletic trainers? Do you feel like you have to continually explain that there's a difference between you and the athletic trainer? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's, a, it's a highly collaborative process. So we each own our respective skill areas. So for athletic trainers, owning the emergency care on the field, acute injury, management and taking care of the day-to-day -day tasks. And then for PTs and, and um, within our organization, taking care of the subacute and the more medium to long-term injuries. Um, so it, it really comes down to um, kind of owning those two areas and then working co collaboratively and collectively um, with each other. Um, I, think, I think both professions complement each other really well um, in that respect, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes, yeah, we do, do have to explain the difference. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's nice for players and uh, coaches or front office that may not be familiar with it to see us working um, together and um, get to see kind of what each brings to the table. Absolutely. Um, do you feel like you have a lot of pressure in your role to get athletes back on the field before they're ready? And, and how do you make those calls? Yeah, so for us, it is definitely a shared decision-making process. There's not any one individual that's saying this person's ready. Um, so with that regard, that it takes a lot of stress off the table because you know everyone everyone understands what the standards are for us. We're relying on objective, qualitative, and quantitative information to inform our decision-making. Uh, we assess the player's psychological readiness and ensure they've built up enough baseball workload uh, before getting into games. And um, our medical staff, coaching staff, the player, front office, all come to a conclusion on you know, whether or not the, the player is, is ready to go. So having 
everyone uh, bought in on that process and having an open dialogue and open communication goes along mm -hmm. with, with making sure um, you know, everyone's on the same page. Sure. And this is kind of a three part question, but all related. So um, we had students ask, how was the OCS certification process? What made you choose to get your OCS? And do you feel like that gave you an edge um, kind of on, on competition for, for job positions and things like that? Sure. So another aspect to doing residency training is that it's a fast track to specialization. So you're able to take, you're able to sit for your board's examination at the conclusion of the residency. Um, whereas if you just go out and work in a clinic, you have to accumulate enough work hours and meet certain criteria to be able to take a, uh, a specialist exam, which is typically takes a, a, a longer process. So for me, it, it came down to either going to a sports residency or an orthopedic um, residency and kind of like what I mentioned um, earlier for me I really wanted to invest in um, improving my clinical skills and clinical decision making and develop um, you know good practice patterns and I felt like an orthopedic residency for me with getting more time in the clinic and more dedicated mentorship time in that setting would fit my needs a little bit better uh, whereas going a, going a sports residency route, you get more exposure in the training room and with on-field management. And um, at the time, I didn't feel like I needed I needed that as much. Um, so having that residency training um, not only helped on the clinical aspect, but yes, also improved my competitiveness with getting into a fellowship. One, it's mm -hmm. mandatory. You have to, you, to get into the, that fellowship, you have to have had residency training uh, previously, but mm -hmm. um, also would have opened up um, a lot of, of different doors for me um, from just having that experience and exposure. Absolutely. Well, that is all the questions that we have. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Carlin, for, for being here. I know as someone who worked in athletics, I, it was great to talk to someone else in the field. Um, Oh, actually, we just had a question come in. Um, question is, what if you're, which you, I think you kind of covered this already, but um, in case a students came in late, but what is your advice on getting involved in the sports realm as a student? Um, did you do, did you personally do any volunteering or shattering as a student? I think you may have covered this, but if you want to just kind of recap. <laughs> yeah, sure. So for me, my exposure in school was just on a clinical rotation. Uh, that I had uh, at the affiliation they had uh, they treated a lot of athletes and throwers in the in the clinical setting I didn't get any volunteer or experience uh, besides that as a student but I know for sure there are teams that will take students for clinical rotations or be willing to just have you come in and shadow and kind of see what it's like so I would encourage you um, once everything gets under control uh, this year, because pretty much every, every sport, you know, the, the restrictions this year are, are making um, the volunteer opportunities a, a challenge. But um, I'm, I'm sure that in the future that there will be more opportunities to do that, whether it's at the high school level, uh, the, co the college level, professional level. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of opportunities, especially in the, in the Fort Worth area for you guys to um, get some exposure that way. And we've actually had several more questions come in, so you are not off the hook quite yet, Dr. Yeah, that's fine. Um, what is the difference in working with an agency compared to a specific organization? I'll try and answer this question. I'm not 100% sure on an agency, but so um, in a sports setting for, uh, for a sports team, typically there's two uh two routes pts are utilized one it's a full-time basis you're empl employed by the organization you work full-time uh in their setting which is the which is uh, the route that i currently uh, work and the second is working as like a contract uh, basis so some teams that may need extra help on the pt side uh, may find a, a, a pt locally close to either their home city or close to their spring training site where they'll, um, they'll send uh, their players to that clinic.
clinic and have kind of a contract relationship with them, um, but they're not employed full time by the team. So those are really currently, to my knowledge, the two uh, two routes that uh, PTs work in in professional sports, at least in baseball. Sure. Um, do you still have a PT mentor that you keep in contact with? Yeah, I still um, touch base with all of my uh, you know mentors that I've had along the way. I actually. Um, Dr. Nichols, who I mentioned earlier, actually came out and visited us last year. Um, and got to got to have a little taste of what the life is like for a couple of days. So that was a fun experience to have him out. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I still um, rely heavily upon um, people that are a lot smarter than me. And I think if you're not continuing continually trying to grow, um, you know, there's really no point in in doing what we do. So. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Very well said. Do you have an injury that you find the most difficult to treat um, in this population? That's a good question. Um, I would say initially for me, we had a, a lot of which hand and wrist injuries are fairly common um, in baseball. And that wasn't something that I had a ton of exposure to um, or, or you know, education with. So there was a pretty uh, significant learning curve over the last couple of years with learning how to manage hook of hamate uh, excisions and thumb UCL repairs and um, different hand and wrist injuries that are common with baseball. So mm -hmm. that was that was a challenge initially that I've gotten more comfortable and competent with managing. Um, how long would you recommend being out in a more general practice after graduation before looking into more specific residency opportunities? That's a good question. So for me, I jump straight into residency programs because with going the residency route, you are getting a reduced salary than what you would going in working in a normal clinical setting. So there's somewhat of a cut there. But when you're coming straight out of school, you're used to making nothing. So it was it was a big jump for me to make anything going straight into residency program. Um, when you're out in the clinic for a while, you, you get used to that income coming in. And sometimes clinicians will jump to that with planning that they're going to come back and eventually complete a residency. And it can be a challenge at that time. Um, at the same token, going out into the clinic setting and working for a few months or for a year, you do gain a little bit of um, experience on your own and can identify a little bit more where areas that you may be weak. And you could go into a residency program in, in, a, in a better position to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's pros and cons to going both routes. Um, I would encourage you to um, you know, research it, learn as much as you can, as early as you can, because it is, uh, it is a competitive process. It's not as competitive as what it was getting into PT school, but uh, there are a lot of people that are uh, seeking residency programs. So um, definitely look, in, look into it as early as you can. Um, so I know that you probably can't get too specific about the Marlins and, and players in general, but this question asks, you stated that the number one injury was hamstring injury what is the number one medical problem seen in baseball? So I don't know if there's, you know, a bigger overarching all encompassing medical problem or anything besides hamstring injury. So that is hamstring injuries are the most common uh, orthopedic uh, injury. Um, so with obviously shoulder and elbow injuries are very common. They're one of the, one of the top five injuries. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, low back and oblique injuries are really common too. So um, you can see a, a lot of variability with it and um, have to be comfortable treating different, different injuries and different severity uh, of in injuries too. Um, next question. I've noticed that most residency programs require an ATC or M EMT certification. Is that something that you had before you applied? So that it applies to sports residency programs. You do have to have some emergency responder training before getting into a sports residency. Um, I know some sports residency programs actually offer that training before you get into the residency. Every program is a little different. Um, but for me, the, 
I went the orthopedic residency route, which they, I don't believe that's changed, but um, at the time they don't require any extra um, emergency or athletic training experience. Um, that's just for the sports setting, which is more in, uh, you're working in the training room and um, you will be doing some on-field emergency management. So that's why they require that um, EMT certification. But um, since graduating, I have taken some emergency responder courses. There's actually one that is now specific for athletics. Um, and uh, I believe it's, it is, that's what's required prior to getting in a residency program. So they just kind of um, package up the, the emergency responder training that's needed for a physical therapist and make it into a three or four day course. Um, so it's, it, it is, it is uh, a valuable, really good course for anyone who's interested in uh, working in a sports setting. Absolutely. Well, I think, I know I lied to you last time I said this, but I think that is officially all the questions <laughs> that we have. Um, Dr. Carlin said he would stick around um, for a few minutes after. So if anyone does have another question or um, familiar face that wants to say hi, please feel free to stick around for a few minutes. But thank you so much, Dr. Carlin. I really appreciated you coming and talking to us today. It was really interesting and I know I learned a lot. So thank you. Well, cool. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Okay.